Hello, and welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness, your narrator. Paramedics and caregivers deal with people in very stressful situations, many of whom are nearing the end of their lives. With all of that emotional energy around, it stands to reason that they would have to deal with paranormal activity from time to time. It's an occupational hazard. Those are the stories I'll be presenting here tonight. Be sure to join me here every Thursday at 5 p.m. for new content. And if you like tonight's video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, share the link, and comment below. These things really help to feed the great gods of YouTube so that we can keep meeting here every week. At least the great gods of YouTube aren't asking for human sacrifices. Only a thumbs up, a shared link, and a comment. And that's enough to stay in their good graces. Now that's not so hard, is it? But for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way. And let's get scared together, together. I'm a paramedic, and back in 2005, my partner and I were transporting an older lady to the hospital. We had the lights flashing and the sirens blaring as we made our way there. She was somebody that we'd had multiple calls with through the years. There was another paramedic driving, and we were in the back of the ambulance with her, preparing to administer the first of many medications, when suddenly she looked past us, fixating on something above the rear door. She looked and said, Oh, it's time to go? Okay. Then she patted both of us on the hand and thanked us for taking such good care of her through the years. Then she just flat out died. My partner and I sat there for a moment looking at each other like, What do we do now? I had a paramedic supervisor back in the 90s who had 20 years on the job. He told me a story that raised the hair on the back of my neck, one that I will never forget. In 1981, he was an EMT for a volunteer fire department in a small farming community. In that town, an elderly brother and sister lived together on a farm, and their cousin lived nearby. They were all very well liked. They would do things like offering a plot of their farmland for free to anyone for the asking, with one simple request. No matter what they grew, they had to donate at least one-third of the yield to a local food bank. This is just one of the many things that they did that made them so well-loved. As they grew older, Mary, the sister, became frail with osteoporosis. Eventually, she had to go to a nursing home, and this left John to tend to the farm alone. One day, the cousin kept calling John, but he wasn't picking up. Concerned, he drove the short distance to the farm and discovered John upstairs, unconscious. He immediately called 911. John had had a stroke. My boss was one of the medics that responded. He was familiar with the family as Mary was his girlfriend's former high school teacher. As he entered the house, he noticed an elderly woman sitting in a rocking chair in the den, smiling at him. He thought how happy and peaceful she looked and found it a bit odd given what was going on. Then he recognized her. It was Mary. So he smiled and nodded to her. He then joined the rest of the team upstairs. They brought John into the ambulance and transported him to the hospital, where, unfortunately, he was pronounced dead on arrival. As my boss was filling out his report at the nurse's station, he made a comment to one of the staff members about how sad it was that Mary was now well enough to move home, only to have John die like that. The staff member gave him a strange look and asked him what he was talking about. She said that Mary had passed away the day before in the nursing home. She couldn't possibly have been on the farm that day. Thinking he had just mistaken someone else for Mary, he described what the woman was wearing. An oversized set of pearls and a pink flowered dress. 
but he was told that no female was in the house at all that day. Two days later, my boss and his then-girlfriend attended the double wake for John and Mary, and when my boss walked into the funeral home, he looked over at Mary in her coffin, and he nearly fainted. There was Mary, wearing an oversized set of pearls and a pink flowered dress, exactly the outfit she was wearing two days earlier on the farm, the day after she had died. I'm a 25-year-old female, and I've been a caregiver for six years now. To become a direct support professional, you have to go through training. DSPs get trained in first aid, administering medication, basic fire safety, and how to deal with people with dementia. Yet your training never quite prepares you for on the job. They taught us how to deal with people who suffer from Lewy body dementia. It's a degenerative disease that causes audio and visual hallucinations. We ran through different scenarios on how to redirect a resident that was having one of their episodes. For example, one of our residents was always chasing after dead loved ones. While doing so, they'd wander away from the home and end up getting lost. We had to stay vigilant to make sure that they were safe. But the main thing we were told in training was to never discredit them or their hallucination. We were taught to just play along, because telling them something like, Oh, you're wrong. Nobody's there. It's all in your mind. Could very well cause them to fly into a violent rage or break down into inconsolable tears. When I first started on the floor, I met a dementia patient named Beverly. My very first interaction with her consisted of her sneaking up behind me and whispering, You'd better take care of them, or I'll have to kill you. She then pointed at the floor, as if someone were standing there. I nervously laughed, then ran to my administrator's office. She explained to me that Beverly was basically harmless, but that she often saw children. She reminded me of my training and told me to just play along, but then added, Uh, you may see the children, too. I worked second shift and had many uncomfortable nights. While vacuuming the hallway, I would hear the door alarm go off. Every time someone opened the main door to the outside, an alarm would ring. So, one night I was vacuuming and the alarm went off. I looked out the window to see Beverly, in nothing but a nightgown, in the middle of a Wisconsin winter. She was bent over at the waist and walking very slowly, as if a small child were holding her hand and leading her down into the parking lot. I quickly ran outside to get her. She was confused when she saw me and asked what had happened to the little girl. Playing along, I told her that her mother had come to pick her up and I quickly brought Beverly back inside. A few weeks later, the staff were there talking between shift changes, and I overheard them talking about Beverly and this little girl. Turns out I wasn't the only one to see her have an episode like this. But then they went on to talk about the daycare next door. I hadn't been working there for long, so one of the veteran DSPs went on to explain to me about the daycare that used to stand on the property next door. Years earlier, this daycare center burned down and some of the children got hurt. The veteran DSP wondered if there was any correlation between the little girl that Beverly was seeing and the old daycare center. The rest of the group went on to talk about the weird things they experienced in our building. Staff members were always catching glimpses out of the corner of their eye of someone very short. Things were always going missing, too. And we even had a resident wake up screaming in the middle of the night, saying that he saw a woman on the ceiling staring down at him. At the start of my shift, I was left alone with that veteran DSP. Everyone else went home for the night. I was in the kitchen cleaning up after the day shift, and my co-worker was passing out medication. I heard the back door open and I ran to the window to look. 
Sure enough, it was Beverly. It was snowing really hard that night, so it was hard to see out the window, but she was there. She was standing bent over at the waist again, being led away by something. But this time, I actually saw another person with her, holding her hand. A little girl with blonde hair. I yelled for my co-worker and we both ran outside. We looked all around the building and found nothing. My co-worker asked if I was sure of what I saw, and I swore that I had seen Beverly outside with a little girl. She suggested that we go back inside and have a look. Maybe somehow Beverly had wandered back inside on her own, and we just didn't notice. So we went inside, and when we got to her room, we both gasped. We found Beverly on the floor, dead. I won't go into too much detail of how she looked, but it still haunts me to this day. She was holding a photograph in her hand, a picture of her daughter when she was a child. Her daughter had long blonde hair, and it was the little girl that I had seen leading her away. I'm an RN, and I've picked up some supernatural stories over the years. One of them happened in 2018 at a very high-end hospice in Arizona. This was told to me by a nurse about one of her patients, a very wealthy Mexican man in the final stages of pancreatic cancer. He paid to come to the United States from his home in Mexico to get away from certain people and die on his own terms. According to him, he was a cartel boss and he wanted his final days to be lived in peace and luxury. He was only 43 years old, but the cancer had ravaged him, making him look much older than his actual age. But his time in the hospice was peaceful. That is, until his personal demons caught up with him. Denise said she found him one morning, looking like he had been in a street fight and lost. He was bruised, scratched, and had what looked like bite marks all over his body. He was terrified and screaming about a black-eyed man and his three children. He claimed he was attacked in the night by an entity and its three helpers. He described this man as being very tall, with skin like old paper, and a smirk on his face. He said it looked like he was wearing what seemed to be a black bodysuit, and his helpers were black humanoid creatures with three fingers that looked like claws and teeth like bears. This entity would sick its helpers on him every night and have them attack. His wounds would always heal by midday, but they were agonizingly painful to the touch. And then, the very next day, the whole thing would happen again. And his cancer, at the final stages when he entered the hospice, stabilized. For six months, this man seemed to be stuck in time, neither moving forward nor backwards just hanging there in limbo, getting middle-of-the-night thrashings by these three entities. When he finally died, Denise said she found him with a look of abject terror frozen on his face, and his room was filled with the smell of a two-day-old rotting corpse. Now there was no earthly reason for his room to smell that way. He was freshly dead, and the staff bathed him daily, and all of the rooms were spotless and clean-smelling. I guess the entities finally came that night to take him to his new home, far, far, far down south. I hope he likes it there. And here's another story from a staff member at a local hospital. They have a ghost that haunts one of the elevators. Through the years, there have been many stories of women getting groped or worse on this one particular elevator during the night shift. These attacks are so prevalent that after 1 a.m., it's considered off-limits for the female staff to take it. The attacks have happened on and off for the past 15 years. The staff call it the squeeze box or the grab-and-go. Countless numbers of women have reported getting attacked while alone in that elevator at night. No one knows who or what is doing it, so they just make a point to avoid that elevator.
I work in a hospice and some of the nurses have some crazy stories. The most common stories involve patients starting to see their loved ones coming to get them or angels coming to pick them up a few days before they die. My grandpa was in our care before he died and he kept seeing his brothers coming around and he kept asking my grandma to get his shoes because he needed to go with them. The creepiest stories though are the ones who struggle at the end. Several of them have been with staff as they passed, and they said it felt like they were being engulfed in flames and heat as they died. We live in a very religious area, and I'm Catholic, so I'm not going to lie. Those stories give me chills. One patient in particular described feeling flames starting at his toes, then going all the way up his body, slowly consuming him until he died. It's crazy the things that happen to us at the end of our lives. This story was told to me by my friend in Germany. He works as a paramedic, and one time he was called to help out on a nasty multi-car accident. By one of the cars, he saw what looked like a seven-foot-tall entity with no skin. This thing was just standing there, staring down at the car's occupant. My friend was shaken, but he did his job. Later, he found out that the driver that was in that car that the skinless thing was standing over had died. My friend thinks that he saw a demon waiting to escort that driver down to hell. In 1980, my father was around 30 years old. He was a hard-working and honest man with a lot of good friends. One night at 2 a.m., he received a call from a friend of his who had gotten into a car accident on his scooter. He said he was calling from the 24-hour emergency phone booth near the site of the accident. He asked my dad to come get him and also to bring a white bedsheet for him. At the time, there weren't any cell phones, so my father set out alone to find his friend, and he took along the requested bedsheet. My parents were wondering what the sheet was for, but they never asked. When my father reached the site, there were no streetlights, so he couldn't find his friend, the scooter, or the emergency phone booth. So he traveled for another five kilometers and found a police station. He told the cops his story, and they went with him to search for his friend. They finally found the scooter, slid down one side of the highway. Now, here's the horrifying part. They also found his friend's body, slid down a bit further. The paramedics determined that he had been dead for more than five hours. My father had received that call after his friend's death. It then hit my father that in our religion, a white bedsheet is used to cover up a dead body. We call it a kafan. Maybe that was his friend's way of letting my dad know that he was dead, hinting at it by asking for the sheet to shroud his body. My father couldn't sleep for a week after that, and he still hates to talk about it. I work in emergency services, and a few days ago I was getting a piece of heavy equipment out of my ambulance, and I kid you not, a disembodied arm reached out to help me. So all ambulances have a different layout. This particular one has two tall cupboards at the back on the left. If you're familiar with ambulance equipment, I had gone to get the carry chair. That's basically a wheelchair type of thing with no arms and a set of wheels, and you can use it to carry somebody down the stairs or wheel them down using the set of tracks that comes with it. I was alone and I opened up the tall cupboard to get the carry chair out. It's strapped in, so I undid the straps and I reached up to take the chair out when an arm reached up and grabbed it from behind me. I grabbed the chair and those tracks and I ran out of that ambulance, but I couldn't get back in the building. It was a block of flats and no one was answering the doorbell when I pressed it. So I was stuck outside with a ghost 
until somebody let me back in. My mom was in training to become a nurse while she was pregnant with me. One of the places that she worked at was an old psychiatric hospital. One night, she was working the late shift, and she was scheduled for a very early shift the following morning, and it was snowing out. So my dad insisted that she spend the night in the nurse's quarters rather than risk driving home. Not happy with the idea, but totally understanding the reasons, she stayed. But she didn't sleep a wink the entire night. A nurse had previously committed suicide in the nurse's quarters, and my mom was completely alone, as no one else was spending the night, and she was ever so slightly terrified. All through the night, she heard whispers and saw shadows, and was pretty much a wreck by the time she had to report to work in the morning. Also, a friend who works in the administration block has an office wall that connects to the morgue, on multiple occasions, while the morgue was known to be empty, sounds could be heard in there, like hearing things being moved around, or people walking, and something scratching inside the walls. Maybe they should start advertising spirits as part of the benefits package during the hiring process. They could be seen as a perk of the job, and the union could assure everyone of having a certain number of ghostly encounters per year as part of their negotiations. It would be really interesting to see ghosts on a picket line during a strike, though I'm not sure how they would get them to pay dues. Any ideas? Drop them in the comments below. I'd like to thank all of you for listening tonight, especially those who make it to the end of every video. Thanks for hanging in there with me. You're my hardcore ride or dies, and I appreciate every single one of you. So, until next time, stay scared, my friends. <laughs>